Hello friends, this is Mike from Right Minded, and this is the explanations video for SAT 2's reading section, passage number 2, question 18. Let's get started. The main idea of the final paragraph is that. Alright, this is a central ideas and themes question. Uh, it's kind of like a purpose question, except it more often has to do with the progression of ideas, uh, the actual substantive ideas that are being expressed in a paragraph or the passage as a whole, then it has to do with the structure or the meta-summary of the passage. Uh, nevertheless, though, it's similar to purpose questions in the sense that right answer choices are going to hit on the fundamental themes of the paragraph or passage, and wrong answer choices are either going to be misstated claims about those fundamental themes, or things that actually happen in the paragraph or passage that are mere details. They aren't the main idea, they're a idea, but they're not the main idea. All right, so with that in mind, let's think about the final paragraph and what the main idea is. And here, this is where our notes are gonna be super duper helpful. We're gonna look at final paragraph, we're gonna go down here at final paragraph, and if we're asking what's the main idea of the final paragraph, let's just look straight to our notes, because our notes are often going to be about the main idea. Here, uh, the main idea of this paragraph, uh, at least according to our notes, is that there's this new viewpoint, behavioral economists, and they think that psychology is key. Uh, and here, going to the passage, behavioral economists, aided by neuroscientists, um, are trying to understand our psychology. Okay, behavioral economists studying psychology. That's one of the main claims according to our notes. The next main claim is from the author's viewpoint, and the, here it's the author saying that psychology might answer the question. What question were we talking about here in this note? We're talking about the question of how do you define ethics in economics? Uh, there was a viewpoint number one, viewpoint number two. Adam Smith says uh, ethics is about um, consequences. Aristotle says ethics is about character. There's this third group of people who think that ethics is about actions. Uh, this is the question we're talking about. And the author here is saying that psychology might help us answer the question. And then looking to the passage itself, where we got that from, it says uh, this stuff, the fact that psychology can help, means that the relatively new science of human behavior might also define ethics for us. All right, so that's what we thought the main points were while we were reading the passage. And here you can see that reflected in the top right corner where the main idea of the final passage is that. And we're looking, we're seeing this claim from the author's viewpoint, psychology might define ethics. Um, now, if you just look based on that understanding of the final paragraph for something that says that, that's where you'll find answer choice C. And I think it's pretty reasonable to get straight to answer choice C and realize its rightness pretty quickly and then just move on from there. But before we look at more detail um, about the rightness of answer choice C, uh, let's take a, a close look at uh, answer choices A and B and D. Think about the wrongness so we can have a better idea of the kind of tricks that the SAT tends to pull in these kind of questions. So answer choice A. The main idea of the final paragraph is that human quirks make it difficult to predict people's ethical decisions accurately. All right, now this is a claim uh, that happens, that is inside this paragraph, and we can see it kind of here. Uh, it's got, God, it's loaded with buzzwords. Uh, the words human quirks are here. These human quirks, blah, blah, blah. Um, they talk about decisions and accuracy uh, here and here. We're talking about, we're trying to anticipate decisions accurately. And in fact, so prediction I is a synonym of anticipation. We're trying to anticipate decisions more accurately. These human quirks make it hard, and, and here I'm kind of glossing over some stuff, but it, it is in here that these human quirks mean we can never uh, make purely rational decisions. These uh, behavioral economists are trying to understand our psychology so they can predict our behavior more accurately. This claim is in the paragraph. Now, just because it's in the paragraph, though, doesn't mean it's the main idea, and this is a common trope. Uh, this is a mere detail. It isn't the whole point of the paragraph. If we took this paragraph out, uh, we wouldn't mainly be using, uh, we wouldn't mainly be losing uh, an insistence that humans' irrationality makes it hard to predict our behavior. In fact, let's take a step back and think about um, what a paragraph whose main point was to try to make a point about uh, how human quirks make it hard to predict people's behavior uh, would look like. Uh, that paragraph would look something like, uh, topic sentence, these human quirks make it hard to predict people's behavior. And then we're gonna support that with some examples, and I'm just gonna give you an example for fun. 
there's this psychology uh, concept called availability bias. Uh, it's the notion that if you can easily recall an example of something, so that, let's just say something truly horrifying, um, then you're more likely to be scared of that or it's going to have more of an impact on your psychology than will something that is less easy to recall. So a good example of this is plane crashes. A lot of people are scared of flying in planes, but they're not that scared of driving in cars. Now it's a fact that planes are less dangerous than cars. Plane crashes happen way less frequency, frequently than car crashes, and more people die, way more people die in car crashes than they do in plane crashes. Nevertheless, plane crashes, when they happen, are super big news. They get covered on the news all the time, and so, uh, and, and as opposed to car crashes, where car crashes really aren't covered in the news. So when we're trying to think about scary things, or when we're getting onto a plane, it's easy to recall uh, the scary news stories about plane crashes. Uh, and it's not as easy to recall news stories about car crashes because we don't have as many examples available to us. All right, now, that's an example for fun of an actual human quirk uh, where humans are irrational. We're, we're scared of this thing that isn't dangerous, and we're not scared of something that is dangerous, like driving in cars. Um, a paragraph that, whose point it is to, uh, to say human quirks make it difficult to explain people's behavior would kind of look like that. It would give an example, or maybe even one or two or three, um, of ways that people act irrational. And the closest um, the author gets to that are in these three examples that he gives above this paragraph, where humans are weird, we behave like a herd, we fear losses more than we hope for gains, and rarely can our brains process all the relevant facts. This is the closest the author gets to making the point that human quirks are weird. Now, that's not what the author is doing in this paragraph. In this paragraph, uh, they make that point in passing, but the author's real point is there's a new wave of behavioral economists who are doing something and investigating this interesting question, and I'm interested in it because I think psychology has the potential to define economics. All right, answer choice A, wrong because it's a mere detail. Answer choice B, the main idea of the final paragraph is that people universally react with disgust when faced with economic injustice. Okay, like answer choice A, this is a claim that happens in the paragraph. We can find it, you might remember the word disgust, you might remember the words economic injustice, those buzzwords are in here, and they happen right here. Um, and the author's saying, but psychology can also help us understand why we react in disgust at economic injustice. So people do react in disgust at economic injustice. That's something that happens in the paragraph, but again, that's not the main point of this paragraph. In fact, in the sentence itself, it's not even the main point of the sentence. The main point of the sentence isn't, here's a phenomenon that happens, we see injustice and we react in disgust. The point of the sentence is, psychology is interesting because it can help explain this phenomenon. Um, so far from being the main point of the paragraph, it isn't even the main point of the sentence. It's something that the sentence is pointing to, and the sentence is about psychology being interesting. And actually, again, the whole paragraph is about psychology being interesting. So answer choice B is a mere detail. Um, I want to look more closely at the claim, though, um, because there's a, an interesting um, example of the logical concept of quantity here. Here, the word universally is a very logically strong word. It means that literally everyone, with no exceptions at all, reacts with disgust when faced with economic injustice, and that claim is not strongly in this paragraph at all. Now, it's separately wrong because the claim is just a mere detail, um, but just because we, in general, react at disgust, which is what the passage gives us, uh, it helps us understand why we react in disgust, doesn't mean that literally every single person, without exception, not even psychopaths, not even sociopaths, not even uh, crazy people, right? Um, it doesn't mean that everyone reacts in disgust. That This sort of we here, there's an implicit most of us, the most normal people react in disgust. There's no claim saying literally every single person. Logically strong claims like this are very difficult to prove right and are therefore not very likely to be correct answers to questions like these where we're asked to find a claim that has support in the passage. It's a lot harder to support logically strong answer choices than it is to support logically weak answer choices. 
Now we're going to get the uh, now we're going to get the opportunity to double down on this point when looking at the rightness of answer choice C and the wrongness of answer choice D. Now let's look at the wrongness of answer choice D first. Answer choice D says the main idea of the final paragraph is that economists themselves will be responsible for reforming the free market. Now, previously, uh, I was talking about the logical concept of quantity, and this is uh, the claim saying people universally react with disgust when all the passage gave us was most people react with disgust. That's quantity because it's talking about the number of people we're talking about. We're talking about literally everyone, and we're only talking about most people. We're only talking about some people. We're only talking about one person, right? Uh, this answer choice uh, touches on the concept of modality. It's about the likelihood with which um, the thing we're talking about in our claim is going to happen. Um, strong modal uh, statements say that something will happen. One tier weaker than that is saying something will probably happen. It's more likely than not to happen. And weaker than that is saying that something is possibly, possibly going to happen. Uh, something might happen, it may happen. Again, logically weak answer choices are more likely to be right. Logically strong answer choices are harder to support and therefore less likely to be right when we're looking for a claim that has support in the passage. Here, economists themselves will be responsible for reforming the free market. That's a logically very strong statement. And what we get from the passage is not that strong. Here, uh, the relatively new science of human behavior might also define ethics for us. And here, note this, might. Right? The relatively new science of human behavior might, it's possible, that it could define ethics for us. Ethical e economics would, in that case, if that happened, which it might, it, it might happen, and if it happened, then it would, uh, then ethical economics would emerge from one of the least likely places, economists themselves. Now. If that did happen, then economists themselves would be responsible for reforming the free market. They would be the, pers the people, the group of people from which ethical economics arose. So the problem isn't really with the claim, right? Ethical e if you change this to, if you change that will to a might, this answer choice is completely right. Ethic like economists themselves might be the place from which um, reforming the free market, these ideas about ethical economics would emerge. Now, maybe that's not the main point of the paragraph. I still think the main point is better expressed in answer choice C, because uh, this is the, uh, the last sentence is kind of a throwaway conclusion, uh, pointing the way toward the future type sentence. But in any event, the, the biggest, most concrete reason why it's wrong is because it's logically too strong. It's saying that these economists will definitely be responsible for reforming the free market when all the passage gives us is that maybe it's a possibility. In the future, it might happen. Now, looking at answer choice C, uh, the main difference between answer choice C and answer choices B and D is a difference in logical strength. Here, understanding human psychology may help to define ethics and economics. It's a lot easier to support that claim because it's so damn weak. Right? What do we need in order for this to be true? All we need is for it to not be impossible for psychology to help. Right. Uh, there's just going to be a sliver of hope, a sliver of hope that psychology could contribute in some small way to defining ethics and economics. That's all we need in order for this claim to be true. Now, additionally, because this is a central ideas and themes question, it also needs to be the main point of the paragraph. But then, uh, close reading-wise, uh, all it needs is just like this little sliver. It might. It might be. It doesn't need to be probable. It doesn't need to definitely happen. It just needs to maybe be true. And that's what we get here in the passage. The passage says this means that the relatively new science of human behavior might, might also define ethics for us. And that's the sort of key logical reason why answer choice C is like nice and right, and answer choices D and B are comparatively just wrong, right? Case closed wrong. Um, now, there is some challenge to answer choice C, right? Because answer choice C talks about understanding human psychology and says that might define ethics. And in the passage, it says that it means that the relatively new science of human behavior might be the thing that defines ethics. So you might ask yourself, and maybe you got caught by this, 
um, saying there's, no, 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 the author didn't say psychology was going to help define ethics. The author said that the science of human behavior was going to define ethics. You might think those things are different because, you know, let's face it, the SAT tricks you all the time with that by asking you to mix one thing up for another. Um, you kind of just have to know, well, you either could just know that psychology is the science of human behavior. Um, that would help. Um, but I think you can also tell from context that we're talking about the science of human behavior in the same breath as we're talking about psychology. Um, because the author introduces psychology, they're trying to understand our psychology. The author then talks about how psychology is interesting because it can shed light on these questions, these specific questions that have directly to do with uh, ethics and economics. And then he says, this means, the fact that psychology sheds light on these questions means that something might also help define ethics for us. Um, so even if you don't know that psychology is the science of human behavior, if you've gotten to the point where you're asking yourself, are these two the same thing? Or do I have reason to think that the science of human behavior is some new, totally new field that the author is only introducing right now? You should have some context cues to tell you that no, the science of human behavior and psychology, these are the same thing. And when the author talks about the science of human behavior, the author's talking about psychology. All right, that's it for this question. I'll see you all in the next one.